After his death, Sigmund's glory grew and grew because of his courage when he killed the dragon, the guardian of the horde. Under grey stone, he had dared to enter all by himself to face the worst without Vitella. But it came to pass that his sword plunged right through those radiant scales and drove, it, uh, drove into the wall. The dragon died of it. His daring had given him total possession of the treasure hoard, his to dispose of however he liked. He loaded a boat, Whale's son weighted her hold with dazzling spoils. The hot dragon melted, Sigmund's name was known everywhere. He was utterly valiant and venturesome, a fence round his fighters, and flourished therefore after King Harriman's prowess declined, and his campaign slowed down. The king was betrayed, ambushed in Jutland overpowered and done away with. The waves of his grief had beaten him down, made him a burden, a source of anxiety to his own nobles. That expedition was often condemned to those earlier times by experienced men, men who relied on his lordship for redress, who presumed that the part of a prince was to thrive on his father's throne and protect the nation, the shielding land where they lived and belonged, its holdings and strongholds. Such was Beowulf in the affection of his friends, and of everyone alive, but evil entered into Haramund. Meanwhile, the Dane Cape racing their mounts down sandy lanes. The light of day broke and kept brightening. Bands of retainers galloped in excitement to the gabled hall to see the marvel on the king himself. Guardian of the ring horde, goodness in person, walked in majesty from the women's quarters with a numerous train attended by his queen and her crowd of maidens across the mead hall. When Hrothgar arrived at the hall, he spoke, standing on the steps under the steep eaves, gazing at the roofwork and Grendel's talon. First and foremost, let the Almighty Father be thanked for this sight. I suffered a long harrowing by Grendel, but the heavenly shepherd can work his wonders always and everywhere. Not long since, it seemed I would never be granted the slightest solace or relief from any of my burdens. The best of houses glittered and reeked, and ran with blood. This one worry outweighed all others, a constant distress to counselors entrusted with defending the people's forts from assault, by monsters and demons. But now a man with the Lord's assistance has accomplished something none of us could manage before now for all our efforts. Whoever she was who brought forth this flower of manhood, if she is still alive, that woman can say that in her labor the Lord of Ages bestowed a grace on her. So now, Beowulf, adopt you in my heart as a dear son. Nourish and maintain this new connection. You noblest of men, though there'll be nothing you want for. No worldly good that won't be yours. I have often honored smaller achievements, recognized warriors not nearly as worthy, lavish rewards on the less deserving, but you have made yourself immortal by your glorious action. May the Lord of Ages continue to keep and requite you well. Beowulf, son of Ejtheo, spoke. We have gone through a glorious endeavor, and been much favored in this fight we dared against the unknown. Nevertheless, if you could have seen the monster himself where he lay beaten, I would have been better pleased. My plan was to pounce, pin him down, in a tight grip and grapple him to death. Have him panting for life, powerless and clasped in my bare hands, his body in thrall. But I couldn't stop him from slipping my hold. The Lord allowed it, my lock on him. Wasn't strong enough, he struggled fiercely and broke and ran. Yet, he bought his freedom at a high price, for he left his hand and arm and shoulder to show he had been here. A cold comfort for having come among us. And now he won't be long for this world. He has done his worst, but the wound will end him. He is hasped and hooped and hurpling with pain, limped and looped in it. Like a man outlawed for wicked wickedness, he must await the mighty judgment of God in majesty. There was less tampering and big talk than from Unferth the boaster, less of his blather as the hall thanes eyed the awful proof of the hero's prowess, the splayed hand up under the eaves, 
Every nail, claw, scale, and spur, every spike and welt on the hand of that heathen brute was like barbed steel. Everybody said there was no honed iron hard enough to pierce him through, no time-proofed blade that could cut his brutal blood-caked claw. Then the order was given for all hands to help refurbish Harrod immediately, men and women thronging the wine hall getting it ready, gold thread shone in the wall hangings, woven scenes that attracted and held the eye's attention. But iron braced as the inside of it had been, the bright room lay in ruins now. The very doors had been dragged from their hinges. Only the roof remained unscathed by the time the guilt-fouled fiend turned tail in despair of his life. But death is not easily escaped from by anyone. All of us with souls, earth-dwellers, and children of men must make our way to a destination already ordained, where the body, after the banqueting, sleeps on its deathbed. Then the due time arrived for half Dane's son to proceed to the hall. The king himself would sit down to feast. No group ever gathered in greater numbers or better order around their ring-giver. The benches filled with famous men who fell to with relish. Round upon round of mead was passed. Those powerful kinsmen Hrothgar and Hrolthulf uh, were in high spirits in the raftered hall. Inside Herat there was nothing but friendship. The shielding nation was not yet familiar with feud and betrayal. Then half Dan Dane's son presented Beowulf with gold standards as a victory gift, an embroidered banner, also breast mail and a helmet, and a sword carried high that was both a pre uh, that was both precious object and a token of honor. So Beowulf drank his drink at ease. It was hardly a shame to be showered with such gifts in front of the hall troops. There haven't been many moments, I am sure, when men have exchanged four treasures for such treasures at so friendly a sitting. An embossed ring, a band lapped with wire, arched over the helmet, head protection to keep the keen ground cutting edge from damaging it when danger threatened, and the man was battling behind his shield. Next, the king ordered eight horses with gold bridles to be brought through the yard into the hall. The harness of one included a saddle of sumptuous design, the battle seat where the son of Halfdane rode when he wished to join the sword play. Wherever the killing and carnage were the worst, he would be to the fore, fighting hard. The Danish prince, descendant of Ing, handed over both the arms and the horses, urging Beowulf to use them well, and so their leader, the lord and guard of coffer and strong room, with customary grace, bestowed upon Beowulf both sets of gifts. A fair witness can see how well each one behaved. The chieftain went on to reward the others. Each man on the bench who had sailed with Beowulf and risked the voyage received a bounty. Some treasured possession and compensation, a pr price in gold, was settled for the Geat. Grendel had killed cruelly earlier, as he would have killed more had not mindful God and one man's daring prevented that doom. Past and present God's will prevails, hence understanding is always best and pr a prudent mind. Whoever remains for long here in this earthly life will enjoy and endure more than enough. They sang then and played to please the hero, words and music for their warrior prince, harp tunes and tales of adventure. There were high times on the hall benches, and the king's poet performed his part with the saga of Finn and his sons, unfolding the tale of the fierce attack in Freyland where Naf, king of the Danes, met death. Hildebur had little cause to credit the Utes. Son and brother, she'd lost them both on the battlefield. She bereft and blameless, they foredoomed, cut down, and spear-gored. She, the woman in shock, waylaid by grief, Hawk's daughter, how could she not lament her fate when morning came and the light broke on her murdered dears? And so farewell to light on earth. War carried away Finn's troop of thanes. All but a few. How then could Finn hold the line or fight on to the end with Hengest? How save the rump of his force from that enemy chief? 
So a truce was offered as follows, first separate quarters to be cleared for the Danes, hall and throne to be shared with the Frisians. Then second, every day at the dole out of gifts, Finn, son of Falkwald, should honor the Danes, bestow with an even hand to Hengest, and Hengest's men, the wrought gold rings, bounty to match the measure he gave his own Frisians to keep morale in the beer hall high. Both sides then sealed their agreement with oaths to Hengast. Finn swore openly, solemnly, that the battle survivors would be guaranteed honor and status. No infringement by word or deed. No provocation would be permitted. Their own ring-giver, after all, was dead and gone. They were leaderless and forced allegiance to his murderer. So if any Frisian stirred up bad blood with insinuations or taunts about this, the blade of the sword will arbitrate it. A funeral pyre was then prepared, effulgent gold brought out from the hoard, the pride and prince of the shieldings lay, awaiting the flame everywhere. There were blood-plastered coats of mail, the pyre was heaped with boar-shaped helmets, forged in gold, with the gashed corpses of well-born Danes. Many had fallen. Then Hildebur ordered her own son's body be burnt with nafs, the flesh on his bones to sputter and blaze beside his uncles. The woman wailed and sang keens. The warriors went up. Carcass flame swirled and fumed. They stood round the burial, mound and howled as heads melted. Crusted gashes spattered and ran bloody matter. The glutton element flamed and consumed the dead of both sides. Their great days were gone, warriors scattered to homes and forts all over Freeland. Few now, feeling loss of friends, Hengest stayed, lived out that whole resentful blood in winter with Finn, homesick and helpless, no ring world prow could up then and away on the sea. Wind and water raged with storms. Wave and shingle were shackled on ice until another year appeared in the yard, as it does to this day. The seasons constant, the wonder of light coming over us. Then winter was gone, earth's lap grew lovely. Longing woke in the cooped-up exile for a voyage home. But more for vengeance, some way of bringing things to a head, his sword arm hankered to greet the Utes, so he did not balk. Once Hun laughing, placed on his lap, dazzle the duel, the best sword of all, whose edges Utes only knew only too well. Thus blood was spilled, the gallant Finn slain in his home, after Guthlaf and Oslaf, back from their voyage, made old accusation. The brutal ambush, the fate they had suffered, all blamed on Finn. The wilderness in them had to brim over. The hall ran red with blood of enemies. Finn was cut down, the queen brought away, and everything the shieldings could find inside Finn's walls. The Frisian kings, gold collars and gemstones, swept off to the ship. Over sea lanes then, back to Daneland the warrior troop bore that lady home.